I asked myself on Monday night as we met to determine the halfway point of the SDG goals, how many roads we have to walk just to make it to the door, only to be told that the door is closed. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Rocky Dawuni, a famous reggae artist from Ghana, nominated by M4 for awards multiple times. But his words ring because in a very real sense, are we going to trod the roads only to be told that it's too late? Too late for us to save as many as we can from the climate crisis. Too late for us to save as many as we can from the conflicts of war. Too late for us to be able to provide the food that so many need as we reflect on the fact that more people are likely to be hungry in this world in 2030 than in 2015, or as we get to the basic numbers that 735 million people suffered chronic hunger last year at a time when so many others had so much to throw away and to use. Because as quickly as the world has been able to find a mechanism for a global minimum corporate tax is as long as it has not found a mechanism to be able to inflate the financing opportunities available to developing countries. It cannot be. We know how to run fast in one set of circumstances when it suits one set of people, but yet we run very slow when it matters to billions of people and their access to life and livelihood. I do not want to prey on your time anymore. Work as one to rebuild the lost trust in international action and help those in want. My friends, our region will continue to suffer until the world helps lift the shadow of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the central issue in the Middle East. No architecture for regional security and development can stand over the burning ashes of this conflict. But seven and a half decades on, it still smolders. Where are we going? Without clarity on where Palestinians' future lies, it will be impossible to converge on a political solution to this conflict. Five million Palestinians live under occupation. No civil rights, no freedoms of mobility, no say in their lives. Yet every UN resolution since the beginning of this conflict recognizes the equal rights of the Palestinian people to a future of peace, dignity, and hope. We can see the Israeli people actively defending and engaging in the expression of their national identity. Yet the Palestinian people are deprived of that same right to express and fulfill their own national identity. Must advance the dignity and rights of every person on our planet to create a just, equitable, and peaceful world. We have noted that since the war began in Ukraine more than a year ago, the, de the developed world provided approximately $220 billion in support to Ukraine. The World Bank has added more than $37.5 billion in emergency financing, almost $260 billion mobilized in less than two years. On the other hand, aid to the Palestinian people over a period of 26 years amounted to just over $40 billion, according to figures compiled by the OECD. Haiti receives just, just over $20 billion in aid for reconstruction and development over the past 60 years. African countries were recipients of just over $113 billion over a three-year period to fight hunger, according to the OECD. When this assembly was established almost 80 years ago, the world was still reeling from the horrors of a catastrophic bloodletting that our nation's resolve should never be repeated. A decision 
profound in wisdom, magnanimous in intent, and bold in ambition, was made so that the General Assembly would become the main deliberative, policy-making, and representative organ of the United Nations. A decision that manifested no less than the very strength and courage of our convictions. By giving equal voice to the sovereign nations of the world, the founders of the United Nations pursued a vision of a more democratic world predicated on the dictates of equity and justice. This was a vision that consigned to the past the predations of the strong of the weak, the strong over the weak, of the rich and powerful, over the poor and the marginalized, and of the big powers over the rest. That vision, in my opinion, has been utterly shattered to pieces. Today, we find that the major powers and those that aspire to greater international status are increasingly casting the United Nations aside for smaller, supposedly more efficacious platforms. As the powers that be continue to pay lip service to the imperative of multilateralism, we see the emergence of mini-lateralism instead, effectively becoming fragmented configurations of power. Mr. President, we are living in a deeply polarized world. We are seeing major power rivalry unfolding with consequences that would negatively impact nations, especially the smaller ones in the regions of conflict. Africa is warming faster than the rest of the world. We are told that the 20 climate hotspots in the world that we have, we find 17 of them in Africa. Africa is least responsible for the climate damage that has been caused, and yet it bears the greatest burden. Centuries after the end of the slave trade, decades after the end of the colonial exploitation of Africa's resources, the people of our continent are once again bearing the cost of industrialization of the North and the development of the wealthy nations of the world. This is a price that the people of Africa are no longer prepared to pay. Many countries in the North count their assets in the mineral resources that are beneath the African soil. The wealth of Africa belongs to Africans. The mineral wealth that is beneath the soil of Africa must, in the end, accrue to Africans. It is a grave indictment on this international community that we can spend so much money on war. And in fact, trillions are being spent on war, but we cannot support action that needs to be taken to meet the basic needs of billions of people in the world, needs such as addressing hunger. Furthermore, Mali remains firmly opposed to any inter military intervention by ECOWAS which would have disastrous consequences for Niger, but for the whole of the region as well. Any military intervention in Niger or any aggression, any invasion of that country would pose a direct threat to the peace and security of Mali, but also to the peace and security of the region. And it would necessarily entail grave consequences We will not uh, stand idly by. One should not repeat 
the serious errors of the recent past. In 2011, through the firm op opposition and warning of African leaders, the United Nations Security Council decided, regrettably, to authorize a NATO intervention into Libya. The consequences of that operation violently destabilized this kindred country and the entire region. This war of NATO in Libya is at the origin of the expansion of terrorism and violent extremism throughout the Sahel region with its innocent victims and destruction that have ensued. This is why we will never stop reiterating the international responsibility for this human tragedy which is undergone by Libya and by the people of the Sahel since that intervention. Therefore, on behalf of all the victims of 2011 up until today, the tens of thousands of dead, the millions of displaced peoples and refugees, we call for justice, we call for reparations. But above all, we ask for the international community to shoulder its responsibility and to draw the full consequences of this hazardous uh, military in, uh, intervention by third party countries. It is crucial to avoid reproducing in Niger the errors committed in Libya the errors that caused the degradation of the entire Sahel region, including in Burkina Faso, Mali, and in Niger. This is essential to re-establish trust among nations. If any confirmation was ever needed that the United Nations Security Council is dysfunctional, undemocratic, non-inclusive, unrepresentative, and therefore incapable of delivering meaningful progress in our world as presently constituted, the rampant impunity of its actors on global scene settles that matter. The environment of pervasive mistrust between the global north versus the global south, developed versus developing, rich versus poor, polluters versus victims, and net emitters versus net victims, which complicate and frustrates multilateralism is the inevitable result of promises not kept, commitments not actualized, resolutions not honored, and principles not observed. Multilateralism has been failed by abuse of trust, negligence, and impunity. Quality, education, health care, clean water, and sanitation for all. The creation of economic opportunities, decent jobs, and entrepreneurship, especially among women and youth, must remain a priority. Excellencies, Zimbabwe continues to entrench democracy, constitutionalism, good governance, and the rule of law following the recently held 2023 harmonized general elections. I am pleased to highlight that our country enjoyed peace before, during, and after our free, fair, transparent, and credible elections. Zimbabwe has been under the illegal unilateral economic sanctions for 23 years, imposed by some Western countries. These sanctions were designed to subjugate the sovereign will of the Zimbabwean people. We therefore demand that the unjustified unilateral sanctions be unconditionally lifted, including those imposed on countries like Cuba. We remain grateful for the support and solidarity of progressive countries in the Committee of Nations. In spite of this, Debilitating sanctions, the people of Zimbabwe have become masters of their destiny. List, but we believe that the transitions underway in Africa are due to several factors, including broken promises, the lethargy of the people, and leaders tampering with constitutions with the sole concern of remaining in power to the detriment of collective well-being. Today, the African people 
are more awake than ever, and more than ever determined to take their destiny into their own hands. The unequal distribution of wealth creates endless inequalities, famine, and abject poverty, which make the lives, the daily lives of our populations increasingly difficult. These inequalities are part of the causes for the events that endanger our peaceful coexistence above all. When the wealth of a country is in the hands of an elite, while newborns die in hospitals due to a lack of incubators, it is not surprising that in such conditions we are seeing transitions in order to respond to the profound aspirations of the people. Africa, ladies and gentlemen, is suffering from a governance model that has been imposed on it. A model that is certainly good and effective for the West, which developed it over the course of its history, but which is difficult to incorporate and adapt to our realities, our customs, and our environment. Alas, I have to say that the graft did not take. I know that when I say this, many will immediately say to themselves, oh, another warmonger who wants to wring the neck of democracy, or another soldier who wants to impose his dictatorship. However, I want to say very clearly, without hypocrisy, without pretense, eye to eye, we're all aware that this democratic model that you have so insidiously, skillfully imposed on us after the La Bolle summit in France, something you've been imposing almost religiously. This model does not work. Various economic and social indices demonstrate this plain and clear. This is not a value judgment on democracy itself. Believe me, this is just taking stock of the situation. It's a balance sheet. Over several decades of chaotic experimentation with this model in our environment, we can make this observation. This was a period full of nothing but political games. And this, of course, has been to the detriment of what is essential, namely the economy and the local processing of our natural resources. Allow me to take this truth exercise a little further. Through my short but very intense experience of managing a state, Guinea, I have come to better understand the extent to which this model has, above all, contributed to maintaining a system of exploitation and plunder of our resources by others, and a rampant corruption of our elites. National leaders who have often been granted democratic labels based on their acquiescence or their capacity for selling off the resources and the property of their people or perhaps their ease in giving in to the pseudo recommendations and injunctions of the great powers. I must confess in this regard that everything that I am facing goes beyond all imagination. These are the same people who profess democracy, transparency, who denounce poor governance and corruption, who dictate the rules, it is they who, behind the scenes, very discreetly and underhandedly, are increasing pressure 
to make us cede our national wealth through unconscionable Leonine contracts. I understand certain leaders and some of my predecessors who, because they possess certain weaknesses, because they were under pressure, or because they had skeletons in their closets, or particularly it, because they had a political agenda, gave in to what was being asked of them. Nelson Mandela of South Africa, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, Amilcar Cabral of Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde, Marian Nugabi of the Republic of Congo, Captain Noel Isidore Toma Sankara of Burkina Faso, and others. These leaders were largely executed violently. Others were assassinated. They died in prisons or from poisoning. Their only crime in each case was embodying the dreams, ambitions, and hopes of the peoples that had been killed, raped, trampled, and pillaged. Mr. President, my presence at this august podium before the UN on behalf of Burkina Faso, country of upstanding men, is not to beat my breast in lamentation. And I am not here either to make a flowery speech. I was sent here to tell you that the lies of states, diplomatic hypocrisy, the thirst for power, the frenetic quest for profit, the diabolical spirit of domination and exploitation of man by man, these are the true wounds that poison our coexistence and drive all societies toward perdition, including our organization, the UN. His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the UN. His Excellency, Mr. Joe Biden, President of the United States. His Excellency, Dennis Francis, Representative of Trinity, Trinidad and Tobago to the UN. Elected President of the 78th Session of the General Assembly. His Excellency, Luis Inacio Lula da Silva, President of the Republic of Brazil. Allow me to here cite excerpts from your respective statements delivered at this very podium at the opening of this 78th session. First of all, and I quote, we are living in an upside down world. Bodies litter the beaches where billionaires bask. Secondly, and I quote, we are at a crossroads. We have a common cause that is leaving to our children a world with a better social environment, end quote. The, for the third person, despite difficulties, we can emerge from this. What we lack is not ability but political will. Otherwise, we'd be able to provide progress and peace for all, end quote. And for the fourth personage I'm citing, Quote, there's a dissonance between rhetoric and practice, the facts. The UN Security Council is paralyzed. The UN must shoulder its responsibilities in a world of solidarity and justice as laid out in the UN Charter. And this requires it to have the courage to fight inequality, end quote. The quintessence of these statements by these four August personages clearly shows that inequality throughout the world is deliberate. Otherwise, with a modicum of courage and political will, we would be able, if not to eradicate them, at least to minimize them. Indeed, every year we hear so many speeches as well as promises and commitments, but the proof of dissonance between rhetoric and facts on these issues relating to principles in the UN Charter, including justice, equality, dignity, integrity, self-determination, the sovereignty of states, the inviolability of territory, and respect for international law, the proof of this dissonance lies in what's happening in Libya, in the Sahel, especially in Niger, and the crisis between Russia and Ukraine. First of all, in Libya, after the catastrophic flooding, thousands of people lost their lives. To assuage our consciences, every nation rushed to provide their 
condolences and solidarity. This was, of course, to give the impression that we're living in a society and that we defend these values. Intellectual honesty requires, and the history of our conscience tells us, that we ought to sincerely apologize to the people, the Libyan people, for collectively and individually being complicit, whether it's through pass uh, passiveness or active complicity, for supporting those butchers who caused the first man-made disaster in Libya. It was this disaster that brought Libya to its knees by looting it and by killing its guide before the flooding plunged into further sorrow. And unfortunately, this human disaster was led by the UN under Resolution 1970, as well as the guilty silence and the complicity of ECOWAS and the African Union. This macabre intervention with Nicolas Sarkozy's friends spearheading the effort killed the Libyan guide, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, on October 20, 2011. If our condolences to the Libyan people had the slightest bit of common sense and were not hypocritical, then this murderous diplomacy would never have uh, taken place. And now Niger is en route to becoming a second Libya. Next. International relations are tainted by great diplomatic diplomacy with no conscience or morals, dignity or integrity, justice nor peace. And this is proven because there is a clear uh, hunger for devouring prey. Today, we unfortunately must see that contrary to the good faith statements made at this UN podium, which call for respect for the UN Charter and international law, leaders representing the people of Niger, this brotherly people, were essentially forbidden from, ex from accessing the UN headquarters. Burkina Faso strongly condemns this underhanded maneuver, which uh, seems to belong to the practices of the past. And this can only be explained by a loss in, of essential values needed for any harmonious life in society. The UN should never be used as an instrument in the hands of any country. Pan-Africanist leaders who fought for African unity are grandparents who fell in dignity, shot by the colonialists, these great sons of Africa who sacrificed themselves for the honor of their continent, who fought fiercely against the slave trade and neocolonialism. All of them are, have had their eternal rest disturbed when they heard that a handful of exiles, African exiles, are holding Niger hostage. Yes, dear African continent, just a handful of your children have decided to humiliate you through the shameless lies of a state, starting with Niger. And therefore, I issue a sincere and solemn appeal to the people of Senegal, Benin, Niger, Ghana, Chad, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea-Bissau, and all the people of Africa to stand up in fraternity and solidarity in Africa in order to prevent the imperialists from setting fire to Niger as they did in Libya.